Hello, and welcome to episode two of Polarizing Conversations. Today, I have the chance to explore some deep topics with a fellow fellow of inspiring communities, KJ Conyers Steed. And uh, we dive into everything from how to connect with others in community by connecting more deeply with yourself. We explore colonialism, power, control, trust, and it's a really deep and wide-ranging conversation, so I hope you join us. Welcome to the second episode of Polarizing Conversations. My guest today is Keld Mitzpa Kanyar Steed, also known as KJ. And for over eight years, he has led or worked with community projects that build quality public policy programming and lobbying initiatives that focus on addressing the big, hairy policy issues within society. He's originally from Smith's Bermuda, calls New Brunswick a Canadian home, and now lives in Hance County in Nova Scotia. He has worked in governance reviews that encourage the development of strategies that embrace a human-centered approach and adopt strategic foresight lens that looks at guiding change within systems. He promotes collaboration through developing critical psychological safety as an integral part of identifying the barriers surrounding community-centric policy and program development. So I wanted to have KJ on the episode today because he is also a fellow of Inspiring Communities. And his first article, which I will put a link to in the show notes, is entitled, Who Has Power? Who Exercises Control? Who Needs to Build Trust? And so in the first paragraph of the article, he talks about navigating the shift of meaningful economic development um, and how navigating power, control, and trust has impacted him since the age of 10. And at that age, he he realized how our colonial history shapes and impacts both our present and our future. So as an individual whose le- uh, legal nationality is a British overseas territory citizen with connections to British, Britain's oldest colonial territory, navigating power, control, and trust, he says, is in his cultural DNA. And so, KJ, I'd love to explore polarizing conversations with you, but in particular, I'd like to dive into, you know, what drew you to this topic of... Um, power, control, and trust as part of your fellowship with Inspiring Communities. Yeah, thanks for having me. And because we do have some connection with uh, Venture for Canada, like one thing I used to say with my fellows is, hello, fellow, fellow. So hello, fellow, fellow. <laughs> hello, fellow, fellow. I like that. <laughs> and so what, what brought me to Inspiring Communities, especially with this topic, is I have been looking to have this conversation and explore this topic since moving to Canada. Um, but no one really wanted to go there. Uh, and one thing I really like about inspiring communities, especially when it comes to social innovation, is allowing people to be in the space and have those conversations uh, from a community lens. I, I live, breathe community. Um, it's something that's in my DNA as, as well. So when I have been approaching this topic, I would say for eight years, and I finally got the space to allow me to have the platform as well as explore this work, um, Inspiring Communities was the perfect home for me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, just that open space to to discuss some of these things that are, that are so important, but I love what you said about... Um, you know, there's not always a lot of space to to navigate that. So as you think about like power, control and trust, um, for me, those feel like very polarizing things, um, Mm -hmm. especially power and control. Um, Trust, obviously, I would say, for me, leads to uh, us being able to find common ground, but power and control lead us to polarization. I'm wondering if you could help us understand a bit about your lens as you think about what makes those two topics polarizing for you. Um, I think it makes it polarizing for me in a very interesting way because the idea of power and control um, has been something that I I very much connect with my ancestors. I feel like that topic, I could chase it for the last five generations of my family, being for the fact that I grew up in a country that is Britain's oldest territory. Um, and, and, I, and I always preface that because if you speak to a Bermudian, 
they don't like to go there because they don't want to have that conversation around what Bermuda actually stands for. Bermuda was an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that was just chilling. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, Portugal saw it and was like, oh, this is cute. Uh, Spain saw it. This is cute. But Britain stopped and saw the strategic importance of having a country or a territory in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean for the strategic power and influence over their territories in North America. So the conversation around power and control for me stems back since 1609 when the first British ship was shipwrecked on Bermuda and said, this is now going to be a strategic launch point to control my empire in the North America. So, so when I look at power and control, that's the lens in which I look for. And then as uh, you, my country grew, different points of people came on the island. Uh, I always say Bermuda has multiple founding people. We could track our heritage to Native Americans, uh, folks from Western Africa, the West Indies, uh, Portugal through the Azores, Britain, uh, so when you have an island that's in the middle of nowhere and you have these individuals that come together with perceived notions of what power and control actually looks like, my experience dealing with understanding power and control stems from four or five family peoples coming together and saying these lands are where we're going to be with our country and figuring out ways of how to work together whether it's for the betterment of the island or upholding a colonial system. So in the context of what I'm looking at with this fellowship is looking at that colonial system because I always say my nationality is a British Overseas Territory citizen. I was a subject until I was eight. Perspective. Another country dictated how I got to engage with the world. Even to this day, my country cannot engage with the world because we're still a territory. So we perceived as a property of another country. So, so when I look at power and control, that's the lens in which I look at. Um, and then I, I try to bring out trust because that's where the collaboration comes from, where I look at my culture, where you have, you see the Native American dance moves and connection to culture. You see West Indian and Western Africa, uh, the ability of using um, rhythm in our culture, um, the ability to use finance, <laughs> you know, that stems from the UK, uh, agriculture and innovation that stems from Portugal. So I see the beauty of what happens when trust is developed in the context of developing economic prosperity for a country and a community. And that starts when countries are at a point of tension. Bermuda's invent, invent, uh, innovation stemmed when we were constructed um, to conflict with each other. So, so, that's, so that's where you know I'm looking at the trust and trying to navigate to and bring that to a Canadian context because I see it when I when I'm in Canada. I say, "Oh, y'all, y'all got the colony bug, <laughs> and you got to figure out ways of having conversations to come together and and ask that question: What does it actually mean to be a Canadian in the context of a colonial system?" Mm. Yeah, and like for you, what does it mean to be a Canadian? This is my identity crisis I'm going through. Like this year, <laughs> I, <laughs> this year I'm applying for my citizenship, and this is going to be the first time that I have a citizenship that is i like it's i've created it or in, in the context of you know i worked to be here i've done the work to 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 come to a point where i can apply to be a citizen when you know i spent my whole life from a legal standpoint you know being the subject so i am exploring that now and one thing i do like about so i live in hans county and when people look at me they say okay so this is a black gay immigrant living in rural Nova Scotia. And I tell people that right there is the reason why you don't see yourself as a Canadian. Because me being in a rural community has made me understand the connection in which these provinces, you know, they started. So I see a different perspective. So I would say being a Canadian now to me is understanding and hearing other people's point of views and trying to find that common ground. 
And I feel like that is a perspective that I have solely for the fact that, you know, I've traveled, traveled around the world. I've lived in multiple places within the Maritimes. And it's interesting going to Baktush and being in Yarmouth, where chances are those folks don't engage. But when I'm hearing the conversation, when I'm, you know, eating the food or when I'm hearing the stories, I, I see the connection that these places have. But if you ask them, how do they identify themselves? they would never start with saying that I'm Canadian. Mm -hmm. So, but their shared history, their culture, their, their pain points, I say, you're Canadian. <laughs> like you're, you're dealing with that colonial bug, which stems from these, the, the idea of Westminster systems and how they're designed to, you know, divide and conquer and, you know, put that, con that power and that control into the place where you don't trust your, your kinfolk, as my folks say. Mm, interesting. Gosh, I have so many questions. And um, oh, yeah, I was thinking about what you said about legal identity. And two mm -hmm. weeks ago, I was in, <clears throat> excuse me, Puerto Rico, which, um, you know, it doesn't have necessarily a similar colonial history, but a, a colonial history of being colonized, colonized by Spain, and now being a territory of, of the United States. In some ways, it felt like being in the U.S., but not really while I was there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you know, I was intrigued by what you just said about your own journey and arriving in, in the Maritimes in Atlantic Canada, uh, you know, about your legal identity, which can be different from your, your holistic identity. And um, as you think about those conversations that you've been having that you mentioned what has felt polarizing about those? I would say, how dare this immigrant have an opinion? Uh, where I... Uh, a new thing that I've been starting to say is, if your country had a Union Jack on your flag, we can have a conversation, I can relate with you. Um, but we have divided ourselves, I, I would say, I, I find it very funny, Canada was created to create a railway system to connect everyone. And as this country has grown, we have moved away from the railway system, which means we have moved away from our connections. So the more that we have advanced and modernized ourselves from a um, holistic standpoint, we have actually disconnected ourselves so we've become so individualistic as peoples who live on these lands that we forget that the experiences you face being in this jurisdiction, whether it's the province, you know, the region or the country, you know, it's, it's happening to each of us. And because we're so ingrained to be that individualistic approach to things that we don't take the time to say, hold on a second, let me see this from a different lens. And I feel that has been the thing that comes up where um, it's perceived that immigrants are affluent. It's perceived that immigrants are stealing jobs. It's perceived that immigrants have a better quality of life from folks. So how could you understand where I'm coming from? When in actuality, Chances are, especially when it comes to international students, and that's the stream in which I came into, I tell people all the time, me being here in Canada, I didn't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to go to university now. <laughs> the, the stories of individuals, especially immigrants, they're, they're chasing an idea. They're chasing hope. And they're chasing a faith in something bigger than them because of the perception that, you know, Western and developed countries have. So when individuals come here, they want to give back to their communities and they want to understand where they're coming from because of the sacrifices that they have put into and the quality of life that they're getting. So I would say a lot of polarization is around that is not understanding empathy and understanding that individuals take um, individuals may have not grown up in these lands, but colonization, and I keep on bringing up the fact of colonization, colonization as a tool mechanism, especially those within the British Empire, you know, they carbon copied it. So someone from India can relate to someone in Canada. Someone from Bermuda can relate to someone from India. 
And, you know, one thing that I really do, I have like, these dinner parties where I bring, I call them the Commonwealth meetings because I bring people from Commonwealth countries together and we sit and we talk and we hear different things around that, that we, that we experience with through a policy lens. And one thing that I always find interesting is someone from Zambia or South Africa can experience, can articulate something that someone in Canada can experience but thousands of miles away. So I would say those type of conversations and making people be uncom- be okay with being uncomfortable um, is, a, I would say, a, a lot of the things when it comes to the issues, when it comes to like having these polarizing conversations, which I love to have. Like I, I, I very much it, like get very excited seeing that happen. And I would say like that stems from, you know, falling in love with a Canadian and, and merging two cultures, merging two races, merging, um, you know, my partner's in the military. So that military and that civilian life coming together and just seeing how collaboration through inclusion actually helps healthy conversations, which provides perspective. Mm, Yeah. And I can imagine there'd be some difference to navigate there. And so like what, um, what, tactics or techniques do you use as you navigate those uh, difficult conversations? I would always say failing forward. <laughs> yeah. failing forward. And and being okay with being vulnerable. And I would say failing forward and vulnerable vulnerability and leading with that. I have a very much, like I, I start with Nate, like at the start of this conversation, I said, you know, British overseas territory citizen because when I talk, when people look at me and say, like, I don't understand why you're talking about colonization. Colonization happened years ago. I'm like, <laughs> I have a British passport. <laughs> like, my experience with colonization is present. It's here. It's now. Um, so I, I lead with that, too, so that folks can have an opportunity to embrace that conversation. And I find individuals, especially within the policy making and that policy ecosystem, get scared about that. And you know, I, I, would, I always say that, like, I call myself a policy analyst, but I am not a traditional policy analyst in, in the realm where I lead with my experience first. And then once I lead with my experience, I try to bring the tools of developing policy into the conversation instead of leading with the, the tools of creating policy. Um, so I would say the vulnerability and, and being okay with failing and, you know, checking that ego at the door, just being like, okay, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when you say <clears throat> leading with your experience first, because, um, yeah, there's lots of schools of thought that say, um, and I trained in science. So, um, you know, there's certain schools of science where you say, you know, we have to look at things objectively and, and other schools of science where we say, you know, we can only look at things from the place that we are starting from by recognizing that we are as you say, part of the land, but also uh, observing it. And so that's interesting, uh, an interesting perspective. I was curious when you said people are afraid of it. Can you tell me what you mean by that? I, I would say, when I say that, I mean, being afraid of it means that your reality is kind of flawed. And it means that you were complacent. And that's tough. Um, To share a personal experience, that's something that, you know, me and my partner always have conversations about, especially dealing with race. I remember one situation, um, this happened a year and a half ago. I was, you know, driving in Dartmouth and I was pulled over because the police thought I stole my car. (laughs) Oh, really? I'm sorry that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And... My and how I in, interacted in that space, I was calm. I was collected. I did everything that I was told and trained to do. Yeah. And my partner wasn't understanding. So like, you bought this car. Like, you know, I saw I saw you buy this car. I was like, be calm. Because you have to be calm in these situations, because you don't know what could happen. And as soon as they looked me up and saw where I worked, everything changed. You know, we were gabbing and talking about hockey and gabbing and talking about everything and asked me how I'm doing. And it came down to, oh, your headlights weren't on. Headlights are always on. (laughs) And, and, And so at that moment, 
my partner realized that he, that has never happened to him before. And he felt guilt for the fact that ha happened to me. And I said, why, why do you feel guilty? And she's like, well, it's not wrong. It's this and that. I'm like, but like, why do you feel guilty? And we had a conversation around what does this system we live in uphold? And I feel like until people are comfortable with, you benefit from X, you benefit from Y. Um, and that's something I have to deal with. Like, you know, I present as a, like, I, I am a black male, but in Nova Scotia, people perceive me as being African Nova Scotian. I am not African Nova Scotian. So every time, and I had to realize that by speaking with elders within the community who had explained to me, being like, I understand what you're trying to do, but you're taking up space. And so I realized in that moment that the system is trying to be diverse through the lens of African Nova Scotians, but, but because I look a certain way, me sometimes taking up the space is taking up the generations of work that a community within the African Nova Scotian community has been trying to get for their community. So you, I have to be okay with stepping back and allowing other people to step forward or using my privilege in the realm of being growing up in a black nation, being like, this is some buffoonery. I'm going to educate you a little something, something uh, when I engage with other communities or when I engage with government in particular, when they try to um, basically use me as a token. So I would say, I'll say all of that would be where it's at of why people feel uncomfortable because you have to agree that you have bought into this thing and that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah, there's a lot in there. And <clears throat> I, I want to go back to what you said about um, people from different uh, nations within the Commonwealth of having that, yeah. that commonality and, and, you know, like what is colonialism? It's, I'd, I'd be curious on your definition, but I see it as, you know, the, the, I guess the claiming of land and then the spreading of one's culture so that that culture becomes the dominant way of, of seeing and experiencing the world. And, um, yeah, you know, what you just said about how you present in, let's say, Nova Scotia and people giving you the feedback of, of taking up space. And so I think that's something that we're navigating in society a lot is that mm -hmm. <clears throat> as we talk about, you know, how can we recognize the systems that we're in and colonialism being one of them and race being another, um, how do we, how do we, I'm not sure what the right question is and feel free to reframe the question if you, if you can think of a better way to frame <laughs> it, but but something along the lines of, you know, how do we make space for other ways of seeing and experiencing the world? And and just before you answer that, I just want to say that I, um, in a group that I run, I brought in an Indigenous elder who facilitated the uh, Kairos blanket exercise last week. And um, she prefaced it by saying, you know, I understand that as a group, you experience time very differently than we do. So, you know, we have from like one to four and I will try my best to respect that because I understand that I'm operating in your um, culture. But we experience culture very differently and time for us is means something very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will try to find a, a middle ground or a common ground as we navigate this experience together. And I thought that that was really important um especially for me as a facilitator because i i knew what she needed but i also knew that the group was expecting okay well we got to end at x yeah, time yeah. you know so it's 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 difficult to navigate but also very important so i guess to get back to the question um yeah like what what tips or advice do you have for people and maybe, maybe in seeing systems and understanding what colonialism is and and yeah. how we make space for people yeah, so like I always preface talking about colonization through an economic policy, which um, 
it's my saving grace because like people understand me. <laughs> like it it's mm-hmm. it's it's hard to I, I i realized that very young that when you look at colonization through the social lens people turn off um so i i very much tell people colonization was an economic policy mm. that a country used to develop economic um economic prosperity for their own mm-hmm. by all means necessary so when I say that, I look at, okay, so if we have this idea of colonization, so let's bring it down to the colony. I think people fail to realize the origin story of their jurisdiction. Like, I'm a history buff, so I, I knew growing up that Bermuda was a military base, point blank. And so once I recognized that this these collection of islands started as a military base i was able to navigate that space i think when we have conversations around um bringing folks together especially when you look at economic prosperity and colonization we need to understand what these lands were created for we need to have conversations so i look at the maritimes because i i think in that lens We need to have conversations about why Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island was created. And once people understand why the economic reason for these provinces were created, and then once we understand why once Canada confederated, it didn't go uh, the Maritime Union, it said each of you provinces need to join Upper and Lower Canada, you will understand the context in which we're in such a divisive space when we have conversations about race, equity, um, within the context of the region. So I say all that. And then once the biggest advice that I say is knowledge is power. Once you understand who you are and understand the space you hold, it's very hard for you to listen to another person and think this person's out to get me. Mm-hmm. And that that takes therapy. <laughs> that takes, you know, having conversations with other people. Um, and, you know, going back to my relationship is, you know, my partner is from Quebec and I, I had this perception of that province until, you know, you go to the province and see it through the lens of someone who lives in the province and then also hear their stories. And I think we as a society have not listened to the s- stories of our fellow folks who live here. Yeah. And I always say what Rwanda did after the Rwandan genocide is a prime example of how you work to actively develop decolonization practices within your country, especially when you have generational trauma. Like, you know, we do a lot of we do a lot of research to figure out what was the trauma around, you know, indigenous folks. We know we do a lot of research around what was the trauma of, you know, um, African and black Canadians and the loyalists. But we really don't take the time to understand what is the generational trauma connected with, um, you know, the white and European settlers. You know, people didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to move to Canada. This idea in coldness, uh, nothing's there. I could die. I could live. Why did people leave Europe? We don't talk about that. And I say until we until we have conversations around the generational trauma that we carry, we can not have these meaningful polarizing conversations that can actually raise all like raise all ships, like all tides raise all ships. And I think that's the beauty of North America um, and South America is our histories are bad. They're really, really bad. But the fusion we had to create being on these two continents is nothing like anywhere else in the world where I find it very fascinating that we are still at a state that we do not see each other as kin. We always see each other as someone who's trying to get something. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like I, I and, and, that, and that's, I feel like that's, that's the, the, the grown zone where people are still looking for where we're coming from, which limits the conversations in the present. Yeah. 
That's interesting. And I like the reframing of the, you know, it's like the invitation. Like we get to figure this out. We get to find common ground. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's based on the unique history that, that we have. That's, yeah. yeah. I love that. So you mentioned Rwanda as an example of yeah. uh, decolonization practices and potentially policies as well. Can you help us understand what um, what you think that they've done well? So I, I say what they have done well is bringing people together to talk. Like I like I always find it very powerful that you have two folks who were put against each other to have their resources taken away from them. And then once the change of policies changed, people stepped away. And the void of not allowing people to grow as a country together resulted in ethnic groups putting themselves together, put up like fighting against each other that resulted in a million people dying. And then you you see what has happened afterwards where, like granted, it's not perfect, but you have people coming together, having conversations around what happened, what was inflicted to me, who I lost, and being able to say, hold on a second, everything that has happened to me was because of a foreign entity. Why am I fighting with my kin? Like, these are our lands. This is our community. Why can't we come together to actually build something? And and that's why I always look at Rwanda. Um, and I look at other countries. I, I very much, I look at the Caribbean. Like, you know, being from the Caribbean and like you talk about Puerto Rico, I say it's different because you're dealing with an island. Like it, the Caribbean is such a a beautiful example of what it means when different people come together and you ain't going nowhere because you're on the island. <laughs> so you have to figure it out, whether it's good or bad, but you figure it out. And in that process of figuring out by force because of the, the physical um, limitations, that the outcome of that is beautiful. Where innovation in itself, especially social innovation, is, is created in a way by its environment. So... So I, I, I'm, I'm now at a stage where I'm trying to figure out how can we take the little pieces of what happened in Rwanda, the pieces within the Caribbean, you know, what um, the Middle East has done to, um, especially the Persian Gulf countries, what they have used their, their, their wealth to build up nationals. Um, so for like a Qatarian or in people in the uh, Emirates, um, you know, if you are born and you can trace your lineage to these lands, they use their wealth to figure out ways of empowering them, whether it's through education, whether it's through, um, you know, economic opportunities, you know. And granted, not everything is perfect, but you can see what is happening around the world when people are trying to have these conversations, talk about decolonization, especially in the context of economic policy. That is really phenomenal. And what I'm trying to do with the fellowship is... Bring that to the Maritimes. Like I always say, the Maritimes is the perfect place to test and see if it will work. Um, so I, I would say like the Rwanda example is good, but there are so many other communities. Um, and, and I preface communities because that's where real innovation happens at that community level are developing policies and developing a, a system chain reaction to ensure that we could have good conversations so that we can have that outcome that, you know, creates prosperity for all. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, one thing that you mentioned a lot was the, the need perhaps to listen to each other's stories. And, Mm -hmm. and, and I think in order to even tell your story, you have to, as you mentioned, kind of get, look inside and ask yourself, you know, what's, my story what legacy do do I come from like in my case I British uh, uh, French so you know they fought each other at at times in Italian so my dad's a Italian immigrant and there's lots in there too and um, you know and I'm white so what what responsibility or what how do I make space and 
um, yeah, I've been asking myself lots of these questions. And I think part of that for me has been trying to get familiar with my own story, uh, both in my lived experience and, and <clears throat> generations behind me. But then also, you know, what context do I, I find myself in? And so that's an interesting um, maybe like interplay of, you know, my experience and then the context that I find myself in. And as I think about, you know, what we've talked about and, and what your fellowship is exploring, um, maybe a, to, to wrap up the conversation, what thoughts or advice do you have for people to both, like, explore their own history and then how that intersects with the community that they find themselves in. Because I, I get the sense that you've really done that quite a lot. Yeah. And uh, I would say elders, um, you know, connecting with my, like, you know, I, I always bring up culture because the reason why I'm able to speak this way is because this this has been in the works for five generations. Right. Um, yeah. So I would say we, especially folks who live in, developed countries we have disconnected ourselves from our elders yes. which means we've disconnected ourselves from our heritage and our history mm-hmm. um so i would say the first thing is understanding and just speaking with elders and and really allowing them to have a reflective conversation um and that's something that i'm doing um recently where you know it is tough being young black and ambitious it is tough. Um, it's a lot of conversations I have is how, like, it's why, like, who gave you the right to be in these spaces? I always say, I always wanted to be the youngest deputy minister. Everyone's like, how dare you say that? Mm-hmm. And I would say, like, I, I love public policy and I love leadership and I love government. <laughs> a deputy minister position would be an ideal position. Um, however, it, I had to understand what, like, why are these, obstacles in my way and it took me sitting down engaging with individuals who have paved the way or who have been in similar situations trying to educate me and and let me know and understand the context in which we are in um so i i say starting and that's easy you know it's very easy and like there's actually programs that out there that will pay you to just hang out with elders. Like that's the beautiful part about it, where especially in the Maritimes, um, the people will pay you to just provide fellowship and provide um, companionship to elders in our communities. So you can get that understanding of where folks were and where we can go. Um, so I say like, that's the, I, I like things easy. <laughs> and I say, start there and, and you'll be very surprised to see what you can learn simply by hearing someone's story, uh, who looks like you, but in a different context. Um, and then taking the time to explore where your context is. Like, I think what you said right there about like your own context, I feel that's something that we should all be asking ourselves in the context of the space. Like, how are we showing up? How do we want to be in? And, you know, a lot of people say, like, that's some hippie stuff. And I'm like, (laughs) it does sound hippie. It does sound hippie. (laughs) Like, if you have that psychological safety, Mm -hmm. the ability for you to collaborate, the ability for you to be productive goes out of the roof. Like, I always say, if Google can do the work to like figure out how to develop psychological safety for their employees and be, uh, you know, a very lucrative country. What if communities did the exact same thing? Mm-hmm. So that's always been my case study is like, I, I look at tech companies, especially the big ones, they value putting in the work to understand who their people are, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and actually coming together to co-create that future. And I feel that's not what we're doing now. It's very much people look at their community or look at economic policy as just how can I get a vote or how can I, um, you know, how can I help my people? Mm. When in actuality, our people are, I'm kind of biased, but like when I look at like uh, the Maritimes, it's like, I don't say, you know, I'm from, 
I don't live here. I say, I'm from the Maritimes. So if individuals who are from the Maritimes say they're from the Maritimes, how come we're not developing economic policies that have a Maritimes lens? Uh, how come we're not looking at education and healthcare through a Maritimes lens and a regional lens? Um, so yeah, so I, I, I say all that, like it's, it's context and understanding where we came from and where we want to go. It's like an easy win and it's fun to do. And you get paid in some situations. Like you get the money, you help people, and you ensure that the memory and the legacy move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It's like, how do we move from being in community to being transactional to really like it being about being in community where it's about relationships both with others and ourselves. And it's funny what you said about, uh, you know, being some, some hippie. Shit. <laughs> um, and I've come to see it as a, a spiritual journey. It's like, yeah. and I, you know, I think my reflection from last year is, uh, I think the context that I grew up in, you know, we, especially in school and university, we really focus on, on the mind and, in my in my adult life I've focused on the body and you know sports and health and all of that and then I realized that uh, that spiritual dimension um, I hadn't really explored and and I do think that that's part of that uh, being in community the seven generations concept of you know like what what context are we coming from what context are we in and how do we live with the land and, and all of that stuff? So I, you know, I, I think that there's an, an invitation there. And yeah. so finally, like what, how, how can people engage with your fellowship through Inspiring Communities? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, follow Inspire Communities. Um, but also uh, I'm trying to develop a mailing list of just stories and trying to bring together individuals who want to work on projects um, and, and really don't know how to do it. Uh, so uh, I do have a website, so Catalyst Conversation Strategies uh, can, you know, if you want to join the work, I'll say join there, but uh, Inspiring Community also has that wonderful platform where you can follow, and, you know, I'm on the Instagram, and uh, so, I, and I really love Instagram because it's, I very much believe that we need to work on intergenerational on collaboration. So mm -hmm. um, the ability to connect with younger folks as well as connect with um, older generations and more experienced folks has been a wonderful journey for me where I'm able to f develop content that can touch different folks, um, but with the same message. And it, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. So I would say, I'm all over the place and it may look chaotic, but it has a mission and that mission is equity in the conversation. Um, I don't want to be in one spot, um, but I want the, that conversation to go on. Awesome. Well, thank you. And we yeah. will link to your uh, first article with the fellowship, also your website and uh, your Instagram. So thank you so much for this yeah. awesome conversation today, KJ. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us for that awesome conversation. If you liked it, I'd invite you to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also give us a five-star review. And most importantly, I'd encourage you to share it with others so that others know about these polarizing conversations that we're exploring. If there's anyone that you think we should be talking to or any topic, please feel free to reach out. We have a website live at www.polarizingconversations.com. Thanks so much and please join us next time.